presidents and members of various Nigerian Canada associations spread across Canada, presidents of the various African countries associations in BC, members of NCABC, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you well warmly to this international webinar on reimagining the path forward for Nigeria. Ben Fieldman once said, doing something costs something. Doing nothing costs something. And quite often, doing nothing costs a little more. As a nation, we have collectively suffered so much pain and suffering despite our abundant resources because we have done practically little or nothing about our plight. Today, we have assembled eminent and well-informed Nigerians to provide a diagnosis of our ailment as a nation and offer some prognosis. Nothing will be off limits for them to address including whether Nigeria should remain one or be divided and what the pros and cons for either options are. They will try to identify where we missed it and how we can reimagine or reinvent the Nigeria project to be a successful venture, if such is feasible. We must explore how we can reboot the country in order to avoid war, bloodshed, and disruption of regional in world peace. The speaker and panelists will also field your questions. The views that will be expressed by the keynote speakers and the participants are not the official views of NCABC. We are just a nonprofit organization that advocates for the welfare of the over 8,300 Nigerians in BC. But like all Nigerians, our position is that the present social, economic, and political situation in Nigeria is not sustainable and must change. It is what the change should be and how it should be effected that have informed this webinar. So ladies and gentlemen, please sit back, relax, and enjoy yourselves. At the end of the day, let us remember to do something to change Nigeria's destiny or the destiny of the peoples that presently constitute Nigeria. Thank you very much. Once again, welcome. Thank you, Mr. President. Now we're going to play the anthems of both the Nigeria National Anthem and the Canadian. But just before I do that, I want to welcome Pastor Oni God Day of RCCG, Solid Rock Chapel here in Langley, BC. You're welcome, sir. And there are a few other people that have just told us where they're coming in from. There is Sahid joining from East Vancouver here in BC. So now we'll play the national anthems, first of Nigeria, then the Canadian national anthem.
sorry, Mr. President, over to you. Please uh, introduce uh, Madrito. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we proceed into the main segment of this uh, event, uh, I will proceed to first introduce uh, the moderator. Uh, our moderator today is Joe Ehizode. Joe is the co-founder of Platform Media Vancouver and an employment consultant with Work BC here in Vancouver. After many years as a sports reporter in Nigeria, he relocated to Canada over two decades ago. In the last decade, he has been involved in community development, property investment, networking with employers, and assisting clients to find sustainable employment. Apart from his continued involvement in news and current affairs, he's also a community organizer. In fact, Joe is the current president of Edo Friends of British Columbia. That group is a pioneering nonprofit organization profoundly respected and held in high esteem by the government of British Columbia and the federal government of, Nigeria, of Canada. Now, Joe is also an avid hiker, soccer enthusiast, and he loves reading. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Ehizade. Take it over, Joe. I think Joe is muted, and uh, as soon as he's unmuted, <laughs> Good morning from the beautiful city of Vancouver in British Columbia. And I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. I'm so happy to be in your midst. And I can see that Nigerians spread across the globe is attending this event. And I'd like to welcome you for those in America and those in Nigeria and those in Europe and more especially some of those of us in Vancouver, British Columbia, I say welcome. Um, let me quickly respect the high office of the excellency Mr. Denika Ashekun, the High Commissioner in Ottawa. His Excellency, I heartily welcome you to this event. Um, I know some all of you are muted. I am so, so delighted that I am here. Um, we're here to look at, speak on specific issue about Nigeria at this particular time. But before we do that, let me welcome the panelists and our keynote speaker. Uh, before we do that, let me give you a little bit background about our keynote speaker. His name is Dr. Sunday Adelaja. This is somebody I've admired from a distance. Never met him, but it's like he lives in my bedroom. I, I listen to him every day. I watch him. <laughs> and I read some of his books. So, Dr. Adeloja is the founder of Senior Pastor Embassy of Blessed Kingdom of, of God from all of all nations, based in Kiev, Ukraine. The church is the largest church in Europe. I can testify to that because some of my friends from Ukraine have told me about a lot about this man. With over 25 members, 100,000 members in Ukraine, 100 churches spread around the world. The church feeds thousands of people daily, a soup kitchen in Kiev, and operates a program that helps homeless people acquire skills to reintegrate, in, into, uh, re reintegrate them into the society. Through the Church Love Re Rehabilitation Center, more than 5,000 drug and alcoholic addicts have been set free and rehabilitated. Dr. Adelaja is very active in spreading the word of God. And as a matter of fact, he has authored dozens of books, and many of them are bestsellers. The high point of his activism is when he, he prayed in the opening session of the, uh, the US United, uh, United States of America House of Congress, and that was in 2007. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Dr. Sondi Adelaja from Kyiv, Ukraine. Hello. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, everybody. You are mute, sir. You are mute. Oh, yeah? You are mute. 
Not that man. That, that's what it was. Hello, sir. Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for welcoming me, Mr. Joe. Thank you so much, President. Thank you, His Excellency, and everybody over there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, the panelists right now, we have Professor Oke Onuchuko. Professor Onuchuko is a professor of quantitative and public sector economics at the University of Port Harcourt and head of the University of Port Harcourt Business School. A visiting professor to various universities, Professor Onuchuku is a first class academic who has published over 100 articles in various academic journals. He's a life member of the prestigious Nigerian Economic Society, NES. Professor Onuchuku research interests are on the public sector, monetary economics, macroeconomics, international finance, and quantity and econo econometrics. Is a counselor and motivational speaker. I've read about this man, and I cannot be happy enough to welcome him to this forum because he will be talking a lot about how we can move, for, move Nigeria forward in terms of economic uh, projections. Professor Onokulu, Onuchuku, welcome. You are mute, sir. You are mute. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. good to hear from you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm happy you know, to be part of this this evening. Thank you. Welcome. Here we are talking about evening. I'm sure there is in the morning. I want to also thank the Nigerian ambassador there for coming and being live in this program because if there are some people, they will tell you that they are very engaged. You know, I want to welcome him and thank the president, you know, for actually putting me on this program. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the second panel, uh, panelist, we have Dr. Mr. Timmy Agama. Timmy spent 20 years in Infotech, 15 of which were in the UK, where the small software house he founded bid firms with over 2,000 staff to win Golden Sachs as a client. For the first 10 years, he has been back home to Nigeria, where he built the first tomato coat chain from farm to city. Did some government business, advised government at the highest level, and participated in several presidential elections. Today, he's building a company to help the urban poor get access to 30% cheaper food. Wow. Timmy would describe himself as a beneficiary of the Nigerian system who has seen that the system must change. Otherwise, it will simply destroy all of us. Mr. Agama, welcome to the program. You are on mute, sir. You are still on mute. You are still muted. Mr. Agama, you are still muted. Thank you, sir. Okay. I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Mr. President, and um, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, for your kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm looking forward to this conversation a lot. Thank you. Last but not the least, we have Dr. Godwin Ude. Dr. Ude is a pharmacist, business consultant, psychotherapist, clinical counselor, wellness coach, author, and community development consultant. He's the president and CEO of the Suri-based Kingdom Acts Foundation. The foundation is, a pop is popular in Suri, um a based charity organization and is focused on serving the most vulnerable members of the community including the homeless drug addicts seniors new immigrants indigenous community children with special needs etc he's passionate about empowering people to live fulfilled life dr ude welcome to the program thank you very much uh, mr moderator also want to thank the president of uh association and all the executive members and also thank uh, the other panelists it's a pleasure to be here well gentlemen uh and um all our members around the world and um, we're about to kick start that let me quickly um call on the keynote speaker dr Sunday Sorry, just, just just before you do that the, the yes. president is going to make um an introduction Sure. Okay. Yes, Mr. President. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, 
Uh, before the keynote speaker speaks, uh, we will uh, um, be privileged to have uh, the opening remarks from His Excellency, the Ambassador of uh, Nigeria to Canada. And it's my pleasure to offer a very brief uh, introduction. Uh, we all know His Excellency, Mr. Deinka Ashikun. Um, he was a business management consultant, a seasoned banking and marketing practitioner before he was appointed to be um, Nigeria's uh, High Commissioner to Canada. Um, His Excellency is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, where he obtained his uh, Bachelor of Business Administration and he majored in marketing. He went on to obtain uh, his MBA from California State University. And uh, all along in his professional life, he's been a hardcore business and professional person. And uh, I have the honor to also inform us that while he was at UBA, uh, Ambassador Denika won an award for production innovation for leading a team that developed and launched two highly innovative and successful consumer loan pro products. We have been greatly blessed having him here with us in Canada these years. We have seen a lot of innovations that have come in from the High Commission. And uh, it's been wonderful that uh, uh, so much progress has been made in terms of uh, advocating for the interests of Nigerians and elevating our virus suffering. It's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Ambassador Adeninka Shikun to please uh, offer his opening remark. Your Excellency, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the keynote speaker, Dr. Sunday Adelaja, the man for whom I have great respect and affection, the author of Church Shift. The panelist, Professor Oke Onochuku, Mr. Timi Agama, Dr. Godwin Ude, President of the Nigeria Canada Association of British Columbia, my friend and brother, Mr. Soye Brown, members of the NCABC present in attendance, the planning committee, Nigerians and friends of Nigeria joining from various parts of the world, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure to join the Nigeria Canada Association of British Columbia and Nigerians from various parts of the world for this virtual international independence lecture Reimagine the path forward with a sub-theme, Nigeria, past, present, and future. Thank you for producing a timely theme for this anniversary lecture. As we mark the 61st anniversary of Nigeria's independence, I am reminded of the aspirations of our founding fathers and the passion for a great and unified country. The journey since 1960 has been remarkable, daunting in some respects, but with challenges, which in my opinion are surmountable. Nigeria, without any doubt, has tremendous and enviable economic potential and abundant resources. We are the most populous nation and have the largest economy on the African continent. Moreover, our young, energetic, and tech-savvy population makes the country an investor's haven and is one more reason for us to believe in a brighter tomorrow. Who would not want to trade with a nation that has a population of 200 million people? We have played notable roles on the African continent, and we have what it takes to be a more comprehensive and influential global player. Nigerians are highly educated achievers in various fields of endeavor across the world. We are ambitious and resilient. These are crucial components that add value to developing economies all over the world. Indeed, these are the attributes that make Nigerians stand out. Nigerians have become notorious for our swagger, or swag, as we say in these days. In Nigerians are known globally. Wherever we go, we're easy to identify. However, it will be a matter of self-denial to say we are not aware of the profound challenges facing our nation right now. The challenges of nation building and branding are not unique to Nigeria. 
every great nation you can think of has at some point had to deal with pressures, internal contradictions, and crises that led people to question the viability of the nation state that they were trying to build. Many of the nations we admire today exist because the people worked hard to resolve their problems. But even advanced democracies still have to contend with internal struggle, struggles and separatist agitations. It's not a new thing. It's um, even the developing countries deal with these problems. Nigeria is just 61 years old. Some of the problems we face today are synonymous with the teething issues of nationhood, but they must be dealt with in a forthright and candid manner. We have allowed our ethnic differences, which should be a source of strength and appeal, to divide us. Meanwhile, diversity contributes to the strength and viability of some of the advanced countries to which our citizens are relocating in droves. In Canada, where we are today, diversity is a critical aspect of life and is woven intricately into the social fabric. As we deliberate today, I hope we can brainstorm on critical issues and develop appropriate solutions to overcome the cultural, linguistic, and religious divisions we see today and forge a better national identity. Let us work together to build the nation of our dreams. I make bold to say no one else will do it for us. I believe the decision to hold this international independence anniversary lecture is born out of a concern for the future of Nigeria. And I'm hopeful some constructive ideas and proposals will come from it. For those of us who live in Canada, keep up the patriotic and resilient spirit and see how some of the things that we have observed that have worked well in Canada may be adapted to situations and circumstances back home. How can we help proffer solutions that would serve to promote social cohesion, bridge the gap between the rich and the poor, and link government policies to grassroots development. Let us not forget we, where we are. Let us not forget home where we are. We can learn from other migrant communities who have used their position here to benefit the home country one way or the other. If you look at some of the migrant communities in Canada, you find out that they've become influential, they've become a force to be reckoned with, and they're using their influence and their power and what they've accomplished to benefit the home country. I think we can learn from them. Moving on, I'd like to say that in terms of bilateral relations with Canada, I'm happy to inform you that our relationship is on a sound and steady footing. It continues to be characterized by robust engagement in trade and investment, collaboration in the all-important education sector, migration and developmental aid, among others. Consequently, Canada will host the sixth binational commission shortly. This meeting will provide a forum for further deliberation to dig deeper as we address issues of mutual concern for both countries. The BNC um, is a forum whereby the two countries get together. Nigeria will host one year and Canada will, will host the next. It's Canada's turn to host right now. And we believe that now that the elections have, have taken place, a day to be fixed where we can come together and look at issues of mutual concern and dig deeper with a, with a, a view to finding, to, to, to reaching decisions that will, make, that will be mutually beneficial. I'd like to assure listeners, especially those Nigerians in Canada, that citizens diplomacy is the cardinal comp component of our work at the Nigeria High Commission. Therefore, we owe you a duty, and I use the word duty, to provide passports and other relevant services promptly, efficiently, and under the most convenient conditions possible. It is our commitment, and we are, we are not going to waver in that, in that respect. The COVID-19 pandemic delayed many activities. We experienced challenges with our services due to continued lockdown order in Ontario, which we have since addressed. On a positive note, the mission took advantage of the lockdown in Ontario to visit five provinces for passport intervention to ease the pains of our citizens across Canada who would have spent thousands of dollars to visit Ottawa with family members to renew their passports. And so we visited Vancouver in March 2021, and 264 passports were produced and issued. Edmonton, 440. Winnipeg, 350. Saskatoon, 338. Calgary, 1,054. In all, we captured and produced 2,000 
446 yes, passports. May I see this opportunity to appreciate the Nigeria Canada Association in British Columbia for their warm hospitality when they came for passport intervention in BC towards the end of March. It was the first exercise of the year and the first we had done in a long time. And I was in attendance for this one personally with my wife. Mr. President, you and your team, Mrs. Brown inclusive or exceptional, we will be back. We, are, we intend to visit other provinces over the next few months, subject to the availability of passport booklets and possible COVID-related restrictions. Providing you with this service is a high priority because it is cost-effective and convenient for you all. We are in talk with all the executives of the Nigeria Canada associations all over Canada to ensure that they charge reasonable fees to our citizens. We know that they have expenses which they incur in organizing the event locally, but we want to be sure that the fees being cut as citizens are reasonable and affordable. On a positive note also, we hope to roll out the 10-year passport as soon as possible in Canada. As you all know, to go a long way in solving the challenges we face with passport renewal. However, an essential requirement for the rollout process is the acquisition of the Nigeria Identification Number, the NIN. It is compulsory for all Nigerians. Please get it as soon as you can because you need it to be able to get a 10-year passport. The presidents of the chapters can give you an update on the, on the centers across Canada where this service is being offered. You can also check our websites and social media platforms to get the addresses and the names of centers where you can get NIN enrollment done. So the phone numbers and, and the addresses of the vendors are there. On a final note, COVID-19 pandemic is unfortunately still very much with us. I therefore encourage you to please stay safe and follow provincial guidelines to protect yourselves and others. I, I urge you to continue to be law-abiding citizens in Canada. The High Commission is highly appreciative of how you conduct your affairs, and in particular, your contributions to diaspora remittances that have contributed to our economy in Nigeria. I say very often that I'm a blessed uh, ambassador because I'm in a country where the Nigerians give a good account of themselves and make us very proud. So please keep up the good work. You are the ambassadors. I may be the High Commissioner, but you are all ambassadors of the country. So continue in that way and um, continue to give the narrative on our country a good and positive boost. Once again, I'm thankful for this opportunity. I'm glad to be here. Happy and productive deliberations. God bless you all. Many thanks. Thank you, His Excellency. And I appreciate um, uh, your address. Very pungent at this time. Uh, I'm living witness to um, the activities of uh, the High Commission from Ottawa. I'll be here for, for, for a little time, about uh, 20 years, more than 20 years now. And I can testify to the activities, the renewed vigor of uh, the activities of the uh, High Commission. I want to thank you for the effort you are putting in. Um, uh, guests and everybody around the world, um, we have the floor open, but before we go ahead, let me tell you the house rules. All the quest people who are itching to ask questions, you are advised to write your question on Q and A. At the end of it all, we collate all the questions and based on time and all other uh, variables, we will present your questions to the panelists. Uh, please. If you are not uh, one of the panelists and uh, His Excellency, please, I would advise that you switch off your camera and then uh, mute your microphone as much as possible to prevent any interruptions. With that, um, I will now call all the panelists to get ready for the servos that will come from me and other people around the globe. And um, just before, so sorry, Miss Mr. Yeah. Drew, just before the panelists come in, we have a keynote address by Dr. Sonia Deleja. Can you can you introduce him, please? Yes. So he can give his keynote. All right. I'm sorry about that, Mr. Zamsi. The program that sent to me here doesn't include that. So let me apologize for that. Um, first of all, I just want to apologize. Let me quickly call on Dr. Sonia Adelaja.
to give his keynote address. Dr. Adelaide, please. You're mute. You're muted. I've glued it to me. Yes, great. I have you now. Thank you so very much, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, the Nigerian Canada, uh, Canadian Association in British Columbia. Thank you so much, Mr. President, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Joe. Thank you, the, His Excellency, our Ambassador to Canada. Thank you, all the panelists and everybody for honoring me and giving me the opportunity to be the keynote speaker. Now, Niger Nigeria is so precious to me. <laughs> I own everything to Nigeria. As bad as our country is, <laughs> I want to tell you my little story. I grew up in a state that is very close to Lagos, and Lagos is supposed to be the most civilized city in, in our country. So I grew up two hours from Lagos in Ijebode, maybe five minutes drive, one, yeah, five minutes walk or drive, no, drive from Ijebode. It's a village called Idomila. And, uh, but my father is from Ijebode, and from, my mother is from Idomila. I grew up there. Uh, but, you know, I didn't wear shoes till I was 12. Uh, I, di I, I didn't get to know my father. Uh, I went to school only thanks to uh, the free education policy that was introduced first by Chief Obafe Maolowo and then this federal government. And... Um, <laughs> Somebody like that, that grew up in a village of 40, we only have 40 houses, 40 huts, you could say, if you call them houses, 40 huts, when I was growing up, less than 200 people who lived, that lived there. And somebody like that, growing from that village, could win a scholar. I went to a local, very local school. I went to a neighboring village for my primary school, let's say. Then in the, by the time I finished primary school in my village, they already started a little community school. We were the first set. Uh, you know, so I was the first set of that school. And so they, I never saw, before I left Nigeria, I never saw a library. I never saw a library. I didn't know, I, know, I knew the understanding of library. When you read, you know, you hear about it, you know the definition, but I never had one. I never saw one. Talk less of a laboratory. <laughs> I never saw a laboratory. And now I knew what a laboratory was like, was supposed to be like, but I never saw one because we were so, in such a local place. So even two hours from Lagos, we were still very local and backward. But even then, this boy, 19 years, 19 years old at that time, was able to look at the newspaper advertisements 35 years ago. Uh, 1985-86, in Nigerian newspapers, they used to publish advertisements about scholarships. And if you do well in your WAEC and GCE, you could go and compete and get and win a Nigerian government scholarship. And that's what I did. I won a, from the village. Nobody knew me. Even in my town, in Diabode, nobody knew me, but I was able to win a national scholarship. If not for that scholarship, <laughs> I'm afraid I might still be in that village and uh, struggling to make, to make a living, to survive. But so as with all the difficulties that this country is facing today, when I see the challenges of Nigeria, I feel obligated to respond, to respond positively, to see what I could do to help keep the potential of this country together instead of tearing it apart. Yes, I'm one of the few privileged or fortunate ones. Not all Nigerian kids and citizens have been privileged to enjoy or to get a scholarship what I got. Because I got a scholarship, free education, through primary school. I got a scholarship, free education, through secondary school. And I got a scholarship abroad through you know, federal government through Nigeria, federal government of Nigeria. So um, I am personally obliged to this country. Now, later on, I became a pastor and a missionary in a largely white society. Uh, in our church, if you come to our church today, <laughs> you will only see 
the central church especially. You, we have a separate church for English speakers where you will see a lot of black people. But if you come to the big church where I am, you only see maybe I and my wife or maybe another person who are black people there. But how come this minority guy from Nigeria, from a village of 40 hearts, is able to build the largest church in this country and the largest church in this continent, I think I owe it to Nigeria. If I had been born outside of Nigeria, the passion that I bring in wouldn't have been there. The energy, the discipline, the thoroughness, and everything that was needed for me to have accomplished what I accomplished here wouldn't have been possible. I own it to Nigeria. So uh, for me, the question of do we tear Nigeria apart, do we all go our separate ways, or do we try to keep this country together doesn't even arise. Because in this country, for example, if I, even in our church, if I, I'm on the pulpit, I'm on the stage, and we have big auditorium, if I see a, a black figure right in the crowd, even if that person is from Cote d'Ivoire or Burkina Faso, <laughs> for me, I'm filled with so much joy because we hardly see black people that uh, it's like he's coming from my village. But then when I discover that that person is coming from the north, northern part of Nigeria or eastern part of Nigeria or southern part of Nigeria, for me, it's like he's, come, he's a family member. When you live outside, sometimes you have an advantage of seeing the world a bit differently. When I was in Nigeria, I had never even had the opportunity to travel to the north or to the east to see another part of Nigeria. My, for me, my, Nigeria was defined by my village where I grew up. The first time I went to Lagos was when I was traveling out of the country. And that was the first time I saw a plane as well. So, but still, I recognize the fact that if I had not been born and had not been raised in Nigeria and had not been and blessed and benefited by the benevolence of the federal government, where will I be? Now, I want that privilege and that opportunity to be extended to all Nigerian children and all Nigerians. So how do we make that happen? Now, going to your topic, reimagining re the path forward, present, past, and future of Nigeria. Well, uh, that's it. Who probably knew. Nigerian independence lecture. Should Nigeria remain one or be divided? What are the pros and cons for either options? I will just give a snap answer first. Yes, for me, there is, the, the question doesn't The question doesn't stand. I mean, the question doesn't even. There is no question in the issue. Nigeria must remain one. Should Nigeria restructure or become a truly uh, to become a truly federal state? Yeah, if that is what we need, if we need to restructure, let's restructure. But I personally believe, personally, that what Nigeria needs is not physical restructuring, but mental reconstruction. Reconstruction of our values is much more important than physical restructuring. If the people don't change, even though the geography changes and the uh, structure, physical structure change, but if our values don't change, we will still have the same Nigeria, or even worse still. So then, what's the next question here? What practical means or methods can Nigeria adopt to overcome its present challenges and realize its full potential? That we shall be talking about as we go on. Is there any role for the diaspora in defining the future of Nigeria? I've lived in this country, I've lived in Europe for 35 years. And you know what? Soon you are going to be hearing a lot about me and Nigeria because I want to move back to Nigeria. After I only lived in Nigeria for 19 years. So, I've, you know, I'm a Nigerian, but I live here two times more, longer than I've lived, ever lived in Nigeria. But because I was born in Nigeria and the foundation and the, the key characteristic of who I am, of my being, was formed and impacted to me in Nigeria, I still count myself more as a Nigerian than uh, a European. So personally, I want to move back to Nigeria and not just talk from diaspora. I want to move back. I'm getting ready so that when I go, I will be ready. But I want to move back to Nigeria and I want to encourage as many diaspora people. You don't necessarily need to move back physically, but I think that we need to take our country back. Anyhow, you want to say it. The, most of the people who are running the country right now, 
That country doesn't deserve them. They, that country deserves better. And I think that the best Nigerians, as far as I know, I think maybe I'm biased, but I think the best Nigerians are the Nigerians overseas because we've been exposed, because traveling is the best education, and I think we have a lot to offer because we, we've learned from the two cultures. So I think Nigerians in diaspora need to either go back or be active or proactive, but we need to take our country back. Now, let me talk about, I want to talk about Nigeria in a way that we don't often hear about. And, you know, and I like the speech of His Excellency about Nigeria, what, the, you know, what he said. And I want to continue from where he stopped. You know, normally I will have a different approach, but today I just feel like doing this. Talk to the Nigerian, because I'm going to be 60 very soon. So some of us who are 60 and, uh, and upward and above, we can tell the truth and they will identify what I'm going to talk about today. But some new generation of Nigerians that we have, which are the majority now, we are the young, outgoing generation, but I need to leave this in history and I need to let the new generation know the true picture of Nigeria because we are talking about Nigeria in the past, present and future. So I want to visit Nigeria's past. I want to us to visit Nigeria's past and I think people who are older will really understand this. Now, most people who are now saying and claiming that we have nothing to show for our 60, 60 years as a nation or 61 years as a nation, that is a waste, those are wasted years, that is what I want to address first of all. It, are those wasted years that we have spent together as a nation, as an independent nation, 60 years or 100 years, is it a wasted time, a period of time? No. In fact, sometimes when you listen to Nigerians, you will think you will think the worst things about this country, and you will think that this country has never achieved anything, and is the you know that we are just a bunch of failure and a failed state. Some it's not difficult for you to hear Nigerians say things like Nigeria cannot even produce an ordinary pencil. Have you heard something like that before? I have heard it many times that Nigerian cannot even produce pencils. You know that's not true, of course. Maybe it's an exaggeration just to make a point, but you know that is not true. Nigeria today produces automobiles. Nigeria today produces trucks. Nigeria of today produces cars. Nigeria of today produces helicopters. The Nigeria of today produces military wires, military wares. Nigeria of today produces sheep, military sheep as well. Nigeria of today produces pharmaceutical goods, agricultural goods, and even agricultural machinery, I can go on and on. Now, let's now visit our past at independence. What did we have? <laughs> Do you know that at independence, Nigeria's GDP, you know, a lot of people used to talk, a lot of intellectuals, some of them are my friends, they will come and tell us that Nigeria was doing better than South Korea, which is true, at independence, it was doing better than uh, Malaysia, it was doing better than Taiwan, and all this uh, Singapore, doing better than Singapore, but look at those countries today. And they are right. But you see, half the truth is also as dangerous as no truth at all, as a total lie. Because yes, on one hand, at that point of independence, Nigeria was doing better. But there are a lot of factors that are responsible to them doing better. Yes, so, but let's just put that, make that simple. Uh, yes, we are doing worse than those countries now, and that is unfortunate. But if Nigeria had only had 4 million people, like Singapore, that is the other side of the coin that people don't tell you. For 60 years, 4 million people? Oh, ho, ho. I don't think Nigeria would have been doing worse than Singapore. But let's leave it at that. There are a lot of other things to look at. But let's just look at, just, just talk of Nigeria, where we were at independence. At independence, Nigeria's GDP, or the whole of the economy, all those things they were telling you that let's do restructuring, let's go back to the regions. With the region, we produce food for themselves. What were we producing? Palm oil, granite, all those things, stories you hear, granite, 
uh, palm oil, pro they sustain the country. Well, all those things put together was only giving us $1 billion, $1 billion, pounds, or $1 billion, they say. Why is it that people left them when oil boom came? Because they looked like chicken change. They were so petty and, you know, so nothing. They were not sustainable. It was the oil that really brought real prosperity to Nigeria. But anyway, uh, of course, we still need to go back to agriculture. But what I'm trying to say is that for people who are saying that we have achieved nothing, it's not true. Let me give you some statistics. And you need to remember these statistics or write it down if you can. Our GDP was $1 billion. What is our GDP today? Over $400 billion, almost five, actually over $500 billion. So let's say $500 billion from, even if you say $400 billion, from $1 billion in 60 years ago to 400 times or 500 times increase, that's 4,000%, no, 400,000, 400, what, how many? 4,000% or what? Of what? Anyway. 400, 400 times, 400 times more than we used to have 60 years ago. Now, is that good or bad? It depends on what you are using as your uh, yardstick. Now, let's now take Britain that colonized us and gave us independence. At that same time, what was the economy of Britain that time? At, in 1960, when we were getting our independence and Britain... Uh, gave us independence. We were having, remember that, $1 billion as our GDP. The GDP of Britain in 1960 was 73 billion pounds. 73 billion. So uh, the GDP, uh, the uh, uh, Great Britain's economy was 73 times, 73 times bigger than Nigeria's economy. We didn't stand a chance. But if you want to talk about America, for example, what was America's economy in 1960? America's economy in 1960 was as, is like the same size that Nigeria's economy is now, $500 billion, 540 something billion dollars in 1960. So the economy of US, if Britain's economy was bigger than ours 70 times, US economy was bigger than ours 500 and something times. We were backward, guys. We were back 20, 60 years ago. I could remember, you know, I, I was born after 1960. But even me growing up in the 60s, 70s, I could remember going around the village. And this is western part of Nigeria where people say they are a little bit advanced. So you could see people walking naked. I mean, I watched, saw documentaries. I even know somebody, an American missionary who was in Nigeria in the 40s. He said everybody was naked. The whole place was a bush. The old place was a bush. <laughs> let me go. Let me let me continue. Now, if what is the let me even make, continue with the comparison. What is now if the Nigerian economy today is four five hundred billion? What is the economy of United Kingdom today? United Kingdom's economy today is two point seven billion, and our own is five hundred billion. But our own 500 billion is, is, is not counting the, what do you call it, the non-official informal market, informal economy. If you count the formal economy in Nigeria, our economy will be one, one trillion economy. But let's count it as 500. That is about five times, five times bigger than Nigerian economy. UK's economy now, today, five times bigger than that of Nigerian economy. But let's go back to what I said before. How many times bigger was the economy of UK to that of Nigeria when we got independence? 70 something times bigger. Now, five times bigger. Don't let us just keep on casting bad shade, you know, shadow on Nigeria. It's not all bad. And I'm going to prove that to you. We've made progress. Not as good as we want it to be. Not as good as that of uh, Korea or Malaysia or Indonesia or Singapore. Not as good, not near as good as our potential is. But for Christ's sake, stop talking evil of your country and only evil. Let's acknowledge the good too. Now, let me give you another information. Like even American, American economy, it, it was 500 times bigger than ours before. 
Now it's less than 50 times bigger. It's just about 50 times bigger. But, 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 you know, because we've made progress. But let's leave economy alone. Do you know how many universities we had when we got independence? How many universities? Only one. Nigeria only had one university. University of Ibadan. You know how many universities we have now? Close to two, we have 200 universities. And if you count polytechnics, it's close to 500 everything together. That is progress. And it's not just universities. If you look at, you know how many, how many doctors Nigeria had? Including missionary doctors and UK doctors, because they were our colonizers at that time. So some of them remained after independence. You know how many, at independence, how many doctors we had? Everybody together, including the foreigners. Everything put together, we, were only two, we only had 200 doctors in the whole of Nigeria. But today, one university, University of Unilag, is producing minimum 250 doctors every year. And we still, had, we still have about 30 or so other universities producing almost similar number of students, I mean doctors, every year. You are in North America. Most of you are in North America. You know, about, of course, about Association of Nigerian Physicians in, North, in Northern America. The New York branch alone has 5,000 Nigerian doctors. Only in New York alone. Nigerian doctors, 5,000. This is the second highest group of physicians in the United States and UK. The only country that is beating us is India, both in America and in the UK. Apart from Indians, we have produced, even in abroad, we have more doctors than, than, than most countries in the world. Now, but that is starting from only 260 years ago. Now, now, let's look at even Nigeria as a city. Do you know we, don't have, we, we didn't have any city? The only city we had that was a little bit somehow presentable, you know, was Lagos at Independence. Now, I know in the ancient days we had Benin City. You know, Benin City was destroyed. They had wars. So, at Independence, we only had, we had, of course, Oyo, Odo, Oyo, that was also destroyed because of war. But re the real normal city that you could call a city was Lagos. But Lagos was like, like, like it, was, it was a glorified village. Even up to now, it's still a glorified village. But if you take just Lakey alone today, you know, Lakey right now, it was, it was Bush that time. Lakey now is ranked as the fastest, most developing estates in the whole world. Now, do you know that even at independence, let's take another sphere of life, for example. You know, at independence, Nigeria never had one pilot. We didn't have one single Nigerian who was a pilot. It was only at, after independence we got our first pilot. But today, <laughs> even Nigerians are training pilots, and internationally too. Nigeria was nowhere in the area of sports. But today, Nigeria, Nigeria has won, in total, 27 Olympic medals. Won Youth uh, World Cup. World Cup. Played, I mean, Nigeria has presence. And you have Nigerian professionals everywhere, not just medical doctors. Nigeria, even myself, I'm here. You know, I'm a black man. In this part of the world, it's like a wonder. The, the people never used to know that black man could do something, could teach white people and lead them. But it's happening. We're all over, in every area of life. Nigeria has done much better than we are thinking. But if we are only going to be talking about negative things, you know the Bible says that the power of life and death is in the life and death is in the power of the tongue. So if you are speaking negative things only, you are creating death. And I'm afraid a lot of too many Nigerians are speaking negative things about the country, bringing about our, a worsening situation, bringing about death perpetual death on our nation. Instead of us to speak more positive things, not to deny, not to deny the issues, we face our issues, but we also acknowledge our strength. I mean, in 60 years, we've been able to produce a, um, a no, no, uh, Nobel, Nobel uh, laureate. We've been able to produce a winner of Pulitzer Award. And we have professionals, Nigerian professionals all over the world who are winning, who are, you know, awards. But even in Nigeria itself, Nigeria has been able to conduct some of the toughest surgeries in the world, even in Nigeria itself. 
Nigeria, they can do, <laughs> maybe it's not a big thing to a lot of people, but Nigerians do IVR right now, organ plant, uh, transplant, and a lot of scientific things that even without all the kind of money that we need and without with all the disadvantages and everything like that. We have a lot of them. But in 1960, even to drink water, drinking water was a problem. Most people were dying in Nigeria just out of poor hygiene when our country got independence. So for us, I'm not blaming it on, I'm not blaming it on, okay, is, is my time up? Two minutes, two minutes, sir. Okay. Is that 30 minutes already? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Because 30 minutes, minutes is what I was told I have. If it is 30 <laughs> minutes, I have a time here too. Is that, <laughs> if it is 30 minutes, then it's not it's not two minutes left. Unless you are okay, going to call on. you are going to count the time of the ambassador. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Just just telling you to Okay, okay. I will I, okay, I will be faster. Yeah. I will be faster. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Thank no you. Problem. I appreciate it. So now nobody, no, death rate from hygiene is no more, you know, even before when, if you take 1,000 Nigerian mothers who are giving birth, 300 of the children will die. 100 of the mothers will die. But the country has made progress. Not as good as we want, but we are not in that place that we thought we were before. You know, it's not, the country is not as nearly as bad and horrible. If we could achieve, you know, this much, at least so far, Let's believe God that we could we will be able to achieve something better in the future. Nigerian economy right now is the 25th largest economy in the world. There is no country that is younger than Nigeria that has such a big economy as Nigeria. Nigeria is the most successful country out of the newly independent countries in the 60s. No country that is, uh, the next one that is young, as young as Nigeria, that is better, doing better than Nigeria, will have a country, we have an uh, economy of, uh, I mean, we have an independence of one, about 100 years or 150 years. So things are not necessarily as bad as we are thinking. Nigerian economy is bigger than that of Ireland, where all Nigerians are running to. It's bigger than that of Israel, bigger than that of Norway, bigger than that of uh, United Arab Emirates, bigger than Denmark, bigger than Malaysia, bigger than Singapore, bigger than Hong Kong economy, bigger than Finland, bigger than Romania, bigger than Ukraine, bigger than New Zealand economy, bigger than Greece economy, bigger than Hungarian, bigger than Austrian, bigger than Argentina economy. You can go on and on. But what are the problems of Nigeria? What are the problems of Nigeria the way I say it? And how could we resolve them? I think the biggest problem of Nigeria right now is the underdevelopment of our people. We don't have human capacity. We have done purely. Our people, our government have done poorly in developing our human uh, capacity. Can you imagine that Nigeria is only 60% literate? Those are people who can read you know, their native language. Not all of the, those 60% can even read the English. Show. So only 60% literate. That way, only half of the country is, used, is cut off in human capacity. So we need to develop our people. But even what is worse than that, like what we lack in Nigeria, is lack of values. We don't have values. And national reorientation is the number one assignment. What is the reason for kidnapping? Is the reason for Fulani Esmen? Is the reason for banditry? Is the reason for Yahoo Yahoo people? Is the reason for corruption? We need to reorient the people, the, our own people, and bring about national values that will be developed. And yeah, a way to do that, I will talk about that maybe in future somewhere else. Another problem that I see in Nigeria is the problem of unregulated population growth. Now, why is it that our, our economy is the largest in, in, Af in Africa, but our people are poor? We don't regulate our population. Nigerian government is not even thinking about that right now. But we need to do what China did if we want to have a greater future. As long as the, economy, the uh, population is growing faster than, than, uh, than, the, than the economy, we are in crisis. I will perpetually be in crisis. Or we have to build our economy to grow two or three times faster than our uh, population is growing. Another problem that I see that we have in Nigeria, if you want to call it restructuring, call it restructuring, but I call it reconstruction. We don't have respect for laws and orders. We don't have respect for, uh, for law and order. Lack of law and order, that is our bane. If we all live in Europe or America, law and order is priority, is number one. If we could fix that problem to, for people to obey the law and rules, we will have a better country. Another problem I see in Nigeria is a problem that is the lack of 
We don't know who Nigerians are. Congolese can come today, Niger can come, Shad could come, carry guns and go and be killing and raping our people because we don't have order. No biometrics. I think one of the fastest things we have to, quickest thing we have to do is to get every Nigerian registered biometrically, not just through paper writing. No, we need to take biometrics of everybody and know who Nigerians are. Right now it's a mess, it's a jungle. If we could put that in order, we'll be able to deal with issues of security and things like that. Next point that I see that we have in Nigeria is the problem of elite versus the poor. I think the, our biggest problem is that we are an elitist society. We are like a feudal society, where, whereby you know, the rich are rich over there and the poor are poor. We don't have middle ground. We don't have middle class. That has to be addressed if we want to build a most prosperous country. The next thing I think we must address in Nigeria is that we must stop you know, seeking to break down our own country. Let us face our problem. Let us sit at the table, discuss our problems and resolve them rather than talking about uh, secessions and all those kind of things. Then finally, I think uh, we need representative democracy in Nigeria. What we have right now is not democracy. I personally feel that no, no Nigerian should be asked to go to his local government or state of origin. I think we should just be Nigerians. You know, you can say, talk of a state of origin, but I think everybody needs to, we need to redefine the country in terms of, uh, you know, other things rather than just what state you are coming from. Repres uh, demo democratic, uh, representative, de de democratic, representative democracy that I mean is we need to get everybody represented. Even the illiterates must be represented in the parliament. The youth must be represented. Women must be represented. Not just the people who are rich. Right now, it is only the rich that get to be uh, rep elected and represent our country. So some of those things, we, all these things must be addressed to build a better country. I have much more things. I have always spoken about 10 points and I have about 30 of them. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Adelaja. You know, for journalists who are in broadcast media and uh, pastors who deal with microphone, if you give them time to speak, um, it's always too short to accomplish that. But despite that, I want to say you are giving a just you are giving justice to to the issues that you have uh, you have uh, enumerated. Uh, there's something I want to say. There's something that links me to Adelaja. Maybe. You know, I, I did my youth service in the Modi Monson in Ijebu. <laughs> that was in the 80s. And uh, you are from Ijebu. Maybe you know Modi Monson. Yes. So I want to also appreciate that. Um, thank you. The floor is going to be open soon to the panelists. Um, I will have, let me remind you of who the panelists are Professor Oke Onuchu, Onuchuku. Uh, from the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria. I know the time is about 7.15 in Nigeria. It's not too late for you, Professor Onochuku. And we have Timi Agama. I understand you are based in Abuja. And Dr. Godwin Ude, who is just uh, some few blocks away from me here in uh, Surrey, British Columbia. Um, I will give the floor to you guys um, to make your open remarks. Let me call on Professor now, I am aware you know what the issues are. Under instructions, I will remind you what that is. Um, Reimagining re the path forward, Nigeria past, present, and the future. Dr. Adela just spoke glowingly about the progress we made. That uh, you know, if I listen, to Dr. Adela, I will return back to Nigeria tonight. <laughs> but we also know that. Uh, we have many issues confronting us. Um, <laughs> for the fact that we chose this shows that there's a, a, there's a, a recurrent or present danger in Nigeria. Dr. Professor Onichu, can you give your opening remarks? Yeah, Joe, thank you very much. Um, I want to first of all thank uh, Dr. Adelaide for being very positive, you know, in things concerning Nigeria. Um, you and I know that um, he has spoken like a real pastor who will believe that we should use, you know, the tongue to speak good for our country. But that does not make us not to identify the real issues that are bothering, you know, Nigeria. In terms of the economy, I'm going to come to that later. 
But first of all, let me go straight to what you know we're uh, here to you know discuss. You know, number one issue there is the question whether Nigeria should remain one well or not. For me, as a person, Nigeria should remain one well because there is you know good and benefit you know from diversity. And uh, as a country with about 36 states with different ethnic you know groups, if these groups are properly harnessed, I mean Nigeria is going to be one of the greatest country in the world. So I believe in one Nigeria. Then number two, uh, whether we should, um, you know, uh, uh, talk about true federalism, you know, or restructuring. To me, it's clear that the kind of constitution we are operating now is the one we inherited from the military that gave so much power to the center. And that power to the center, you know, has actually led to a serious level of, you know, people using power to coerce other people and has led to things like nepotism, to things like, you know, sectionalism, ethnicity and all that. Because the man who is wielding so much power, like the Nigerian president, can do and undo. So we need a situation where such power should be devoted, you know, to the federal units, which are the states now. So that the states, you know, will get more, you know, powers to generate their revenue have their own police and set up the system very well. If you look at America, where we are copying from, you find out that the kind of you know uh, federal system they are running is quite different from what we are running because our own year we give too much power you know to the system. So I am of the view that you know the power to the center you know should be devoted you know more to the state. If you look at the exclusive list, you find out that there are so many things given to the center in the exclusive list. Some of those things should be taken away, you know, from, you know, the center and the... Thank you, Professor Onuchuku. Uh, let me... Hello, it looks like uh, Professor Onuchuku is frozen. Okay, let me um, give the um, the floor to Godwin, right. Dr. Godwin Can Ode. Can you see? Okay, from, he's uh, back. From Diesel. And they use it to run cars and they walk. We also use them to run our generators, they walk. But because they are doing it illegal, they are shut down and they are called illegal refinery. But you see, if the state have powers to you know, invest in this particular national resource, assuming you allow the United Data people to control and invest in this resource, they will you know, tap into what these people are doing in the center and they modify it to reduce the negative externality that. And they'll be able to provide, you know, the byproduct of, you know, petroleum, petroleum, and we use it, you know, to better our life. And the excess will export to neighboring, you know, states and make, you know, foreign energy. So what I'm saying in essence is that until we restructure this country to what do I mean by true federalism, it's not just allowing more, you know, power to the center. More power to the center, as everybody is entering into politics to see how they can control the center in order to, you know, make then another major problem in Nigeria is the issue of corruption. You find out that public office holders are there not to serve their people. They are there to milk the people. Like I've given an example of this uh, petroleum uh, um, uh, industry. What most Nigerians who are rich do, they don't have licenses to you know, build refineries here, go outside to own refineries outside and then take our crude and refine there and bring them ourselves to Nigeria at high cost, increasing you know, the high cost of living you know, in Nigeria. So that issue of corruption is a very major problem in Nigeria. And when the pastor was talking, he talked about it in a more you know, mindful way. But we are hitting it direct. That is a major problem in this country. Not until we tackle that issue of corruption, Nigeria will continue to revolve under this vision of secular fundamentalism. Okay, then, Professor, you know, Professor, yeah, Professor Onichuku, don't yeah. worry, you have the time. We will come to that, all the specifics, okay. you have come to that. Let me just uh, call on uh, Dr. Ode to give uh, an opening remarks. All right, thank you very much, uh, the moderator. And I also want to thank um, uh, Dr. Sonda Dolaje. It's a pleasure to be on the same platform with you. I've admired you from a distance. 
And I also want to thank uh, Professor O.K. Anuchuku and all the other panelists, uh, Timmy Agama. Uh, first, let me start by saying that from my training as a social researcher, I was taught how to look at uh, social problems, which also include socioeconomic problems from an uh, empirical perspective. That means it's not enough to look at things from just the visible outcome, according to the descriptions given by um, uh, uh, Dr. Diaz. And also from my training as a pharmacist, I look at things from a theological perspective. Uh, that means um, you don't just look at things from a symptomatic perspective. Uh, if you look at Nigeria, you see a lot of symptoms and they might lead you to wrong conclusions. So first question we need to ask is, how did Nigeria come into existence? We're looking at the origin. If we cannot define how Nigeria emerged, then we cannot begin to profess solutions to the problem bedeviling the nation right now. Is Nigeria a nation? That is a question we must ask. Are we really a nation? Are we a country? Are we a constitutional democracy? What are we? You see, for the past 60 years, Nigeria has been, uh, Nigeria has been playing a script written by someone else. And we end up with someone's own narrative for Nigeria to become a nation and to be together, Nigeria must write its own story. In fact, write its own story and own its own narrative. That's what other nations have done. Other nations that have been colonized by uh, imperialists, they rewrote their story. Look at India, look at China, look at Indonesia, look at Singapore. They rewrote their story. They own their narrative. What are we doing? We end up here looking at some figures and statistics and we're looking at uh, our complexities. The challenge is that Nigeria has never, never, ever owned its own story or rewrote its own story or its own narrative. We talk about Nigeria as a country. But Nigeria, from my own perspective, is not a country. It doesn't fit the definition of a country. It's a product of a business uh, it was a business amalgamation. And we know that. If you look at the definition of amalgamation, you realize that it talks about economic benefit of the amalgamator. Have we tried to verify the validity of that? We are all outside of the country and we're beginning to see how other nations function. I live here in Canada and I see Quebec. I see how they are being coated. The current prime minister of Canada is from Quebec. His father was from Quebec. Quebec has a separatist group. Nobody works and say, oh, Quebec was, you got to get out of this place or we'll deal with you. Nobody does that. You cut a nation, you cut the members. Nigeria has multi-ethnic groups that needs to be cutted and not to be threatened, not to be marginalized. But we cannot go forward until we go back and ask ourselves, how did we emerge as a nation? We have not answered that question. Okay. Because we've not answered it, we can move forward. Okay. Dr. Day has uh, postulated that we need to know our past before we can uh, see what the future holds. Um, with that, I'll give uh, Timmy Agama, uh, please, for your opening remarks. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much to you know all my panelists. Um, I agree and disagree in various degrees with some things that have been said. But I'd like to come at this from a human perspective, first of all, and I'll tell two stories. One of the stories I'll tell is of um, when I started thinking about trying to help uh, low-income people in cities and to get cheaper food, I sent people into the market. I said, stop women, ask them question. What could you do before that you cannot do now? What problem did you have before you? This, all this food, issue, what is it causing in your life? every single one of them told stories about their children and the kind of stories they would tell were that before my children will eat before they go to school today they cannot eat before they go to school a woman even went so far as to say that she wishes that she had died when she was a child because to see what she is seeing now with her children and the hunger, 
that honestly she wished she had never lived to see such a thing. This is the lived experience of Nigerians. When I was building a tomato cold chain, I was traveling to farms deep in the north. And I remember one particular experience of a farm, a, a, a village I was taking to. And you drive past these villages, it looks like there's nobody there. Then we entered, they say, oh, come, come, enter inside. Let's see the, you know, the head or something. We sat down on one Thai mat. So it's a village now. So the wall is there, but there's no even paint on the wall. You know, it's, it's, that's where we are. So we sit down on the mat, we have conversation. Oh, welcome. You want to come and buy this produce from us? You know, very good, you know, stuff. I take off. As I'm going, I, there was one place I saw, I had seen them harvesting from a farm as I was coming in. They flagged me down. Stop, 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 stop. They carried, a, you know, those big baskets of tomatoes that you see, the big basket, they dashed me. I was touched and I was confused. I said, me, I'm the one who's supposed to be giving you something. You people are the one who are giving me something. And let me tell you what is happening today. In those types of homes, there, is a, they, they, there would have been a, a, a wife and a husband. And in that, their community, they may be poor, but in that, their community, they are respected. They decide what happens in their house. People have come. They have come with their guns and whatever. They have killed their husband, maybe killed her son. She has run away with her children to somewhere. Government of Nigeria say, oh, we'll protect you. We'll keep you in an IDP camp. We'll protect you. And then what happened when you get there? Today, we have women in those IDP camps who are proud wives and mothers, who, because of the hunger of their children, are having to sell their body to feed their children. This, you know, this is Nigeria. And when people say to me, oh, Nigeria is waiting for the stables, whatever, I say that's because you live in the city. If you are either this poor that your children are not eating, or your business is gone because you don't have farm, your house is lost, and now you're at the mercy of God knows who. You cannot tell me that person will tell you they're not living in a failed state. That's a lie. Let's be honest with each other. That's not true. And therefore, for me, with all I've experienced and what I've seen, where I'm going to be going is like really practically how do we, what can we really do? And I'm really focused on the political process because I have been involved in it. I have seen it work. I have been in, involved in state presidential elections. I, 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 I have learned it. I, what I've learned is that what people discuss in Bia Palo is different from the way this thing actually operates. And the views I'm going to be wanting to share are that I think that there are things, practical things that we can do because really, ultimately, all the things we're talking about we all want a better life for our people it is political power that does it whether it's restructuring you want to unless you want war it's political power if you want better life it's political power if you want a, a reduction in corruption it's political power if you don't want kidnapping it's political power that is where it comes from and we all agree that the politicians we have today are not doing the job and that's really my own okay. where i come thank from you Gamma. We have, uh, it seems to me that we agreed on something here that there's a problem. That's one. Two, that all that we are having is political problems because lack of the will of government to do what they are supposed to do is leading to other issues affecting the nation. Professor Onuchuku, you are in Nigeria. Yes. And the, and uh, I've also read some of your papers, okay? Mm -hmm. If a government that cannot fulfill their first obligation to the citizens, which is security, the Bible says when the soul loses its taste, what do you do? You cast it aside. Does that government yes. have the wet with all? Does that government have the scruples to continue to lead as a government? Taking the no, into consideration, the, what is going on in Nigeria right now? Yeah, the answer to that question is straight away. That government has failed. And given that that government has failed, the best thing is to, if you can do that, is to quit. Okay, so, followed. Uh, straight yeah. away, that is very clear. 
Now, mm. you know, why I'm asking that question, I know you are, you get that question, you could easily answer it straight away. The answer is uh, mm. no. Now, if you want to change your system, Dr. Adelaide can, can bear this, can bear me out. In Ukraine, where he lives, where he lives, there's what you call Orange Revolution. I think he was part of that. The people help to change the system. In Nigeria, I keep hearing, Dr. Adelaide, this will affect you too. Let's pray, tomorrow will be okay. But I know in the Bible says, faith without action is dead. Will prayers change the system for us? I'm not, a, I'm not an atheist. Let me be frank with that. I'm a Christian. Who will change the system for us? These are not the people. It's the Nigerians that will change the system. And Nigerians and ready. To, uh, yes, luckily to us, 2023 is coming. So that's why Nigerians, you know, put themselves together and uh, vote out the government that is not performing. Because if you come in here, the level of insecurity in the country, particularly uh, in the north, look at what uh, my brother just did. You know, the people can't go to farm. So you see that the food is not there for people to eat. That's why the level of inflation in Nigeria is still very high. It's double digit, 13%. And the component of food inflation in it is very high because the people can't go to farm to produce their food. So if you have a government that cannot provide security, it means that that government has failed in its obligation. So the best thing is for Nigerians to come together through the political process to vote out that government and you know put uh, the ones out there uh, will secure their life and property. Timmy, Timmy, I will come back to you right now. You are part of the you you mentioned that you're part of the process of presidential election. Is there an enabling system or situation where the people can change a government as it is all over the world? Okay, I I I I, I think before for us to understand that, we first need to drill down into how exactly, because we have to understand that these politicians have been extremely successful. We can say we are smarter, we're more educated, whatever, but they have been extremely successful. So let us go to that school first and say, how is this thing working? And let me break when it down. When you say successful, how Start, do you mean? They, are, they, they have been successful. They are the ones in power. Are you are me in power. Are you, <laughs> are you, are you, are me, are we the ones in power? <laughs> They're no, the I just ask the question, they continue. how can so, the Nigerians... So you, you get what I mean? So, yes. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm about to deal with that. So, so that's why I say they have been successful. So start from the beginning. Where does any politics de derive its funding? Because politics is expensive. And if you don't know that politics is expensive, then look at the United States of America. It's a very open system. It will tell you what everybody is raising. So where is that money coming from? How is that being done in Nigeria? Because that is your first thing to look at. And what politicians have realized, the whole political class, what they have realized is that what they need to do, grab hold of power and then use government money to do their politics. This is the number one game. That's how they will stay in power and then they can use other levers, but then, it's also a business for them, so they cannot make money out of it. So that's the number one thing. They do that. So in that process, what is it that is happening? And I can give examples, you know, that, but in that process, what is it that is happening? What is happening is that, okay, let me, why is, do they always say the governor, oh, is he on ground in his state or whatever? But you notice that the governor is always the most powerful political person in his state. It's because have access to free money, which is government funds, and that is what he's using to run all his politics. And that is where political power is coming from. Why is Tinubu a, 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 such a relevant person? When he, he, he figured out how to fund his politics, that's what he figured out. And number one thing we must think about, if we say we want to do this, we must figure out how we raise our funds if we want to put people who are going to do the politics. And I say in that context, yes, Nigeria, we're different tribes, different nations, different people. You can start from your local government. You don't have to, if I say start from the whole of Nigeria, all of us here will start arguing. If, we st if you can start from your local government, and there's ways to look at it, 
you can start from saying, I want to fund the local government council. And maybe if I contribute money with you, 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 maybe we can fund somebody. If a local government councillor is too low because the impact is not that you know great, you can think of a state, uh, somebody in the state house of assembly. And, and why that's important is because if you have people in the state house of assembly that are not the governor's people, they can affect what the governor can do. Don't forget that the governor is funding every of these, everybody who he, are his people that wants to run for any of these positions in the place, he will pay money. And let me give you some numbers. From what I understand, if you're looking at the National Assembly, if you look at, which is not what I'm addressing, but if just for numbers sake, if you look at House of Assembly, it used to cost, I don't know now, but it used to cost about 150 million naira to get a seat. So how many people in that state you say, oh, is it my boy, is my guy, he's going to contribute to it, put money inside it. Send it, 300 million. But when you come to the State House of Assembly, in some states, 50 million naira can get you a seat. So now this becomes because or something which, oh, if these people are contributing here, you know, something, maybe it's possible to do something that can affect. In some states, they have people who are rich enough that can join together if they can think about it to say they want to challenge the governor. But in some states, you can't. You say, okay, maybe I want to challenge a state house of assembly person. And then the next thing you need to learn is, after you raise the money, after you've chosen your candidate, how are you going to run the process? Be realistic. The, you cannot say you want to go to court and you will not choose a lawyer. If you say you want to go and argue your case yourself, you will fail. Look for the experts that the same people are using. Why is the governor spending money? He's spending money on some people because they are experts. They are experts. They are some they are experts. So just close your mind that oh, they are bad people, they are politicians, and accept, yes, they know some things, and I need them to get to where, to where I'm trying to go to. And me too, I have to fund my own experts that will help me. And I'll tell you what the politician will do. This Nigeria, there are three things you need to win the election. And one of them, one of them who, let's um, be realistic with you, from what I've seen, people going out to vote is not enough. Politicians, on top of those numbers, they will rig. And if you are coming to this game and you are saying, oh, you just want to be nice and waiting call and, you know, if you will not take over the power and things will okay. still be bad. So go and hire your own guys and okay. do your job. That's how Dr. I see Ode. it. Dr. Ode, That's the process. you mentioned mm -hmm. about owning our Why story. Dr. Ode, are you there? I'm here, I'm here. I'm yes. listening to you. In your opening remarks, you mentioned about owning our story. Owning our story, perhaps you mean that Nigerians should define what the future holds for them, perhaps. But I tell you something, just like Dr. Adela just said in his open remarks, he said about mental restructuring. That's one of the critical issues affecting Nigeria. Now, I ask, tell you something. The politicians feed on the docility of Nigerians. It is their, it's, oh, I'm not, like Fala used to say, nobody wants to die, but we want, nobody wants to die, nobody wants to cry. You don't get power on a platter of gold. And Nigerians actually not docile, considering what I'm seeing on the ground in Nigeria. They are fans of Manchester United, fans of Arsenal, feed on that and then things continue the way it is no i don't think so nigerians are not docile i can tell you that you know one of the things about being at this side of the pond <laughs> where we found ourselves is that you get to see things clearly you get to understand the power blocks that move things around you get to understand exactly the fabrics of the country you call your own Nigerians are not docile. They are the smartest people on earth. Do you understand the level and the fierceness of republicanism in the Southeast? It can transform an entire country. Do you even understand the power and the capacity and the civilization of the Western part of the country? It beats the imagination of even the Western world. Do you even understand the power and the capacity of the northern, the northern populace, not the feudal populace or the elitist. Yeah, but, but hold on. There's a process to that, sir. 
there's a process. No, I'm telling before you the process. You get, before you get your own state, before you get your, whatever, if you are agitating for a separate control, you are- No, that's not, what I, that's not what I'm talking no. about Nigeria now. Yes. Totally, I'm there, not telling you about the components of the a process. There's a process to that. First of all, you have to start from the basics. The basis I mean is this, you have your representative in National Assembly. Are you holding them accountable? No, that's what I'm trying to tell you. The people are not docile. They are doing what they should do. But have you heard of one of the representatives you are talking about who said that at the top, they are united? Regardless of which part of the bed they belong to, the wings of the bed they belong to, PDP, APC, forget about that nomenclature. These guys are a group of business people. Politics in Africa is a corporation. It's a business. You see, uh, Timmy, uh, Timmy Agama talked about it. Look at how much money you should raise for you to become something. Look at what is going on in the country. So let me tell you this, Nigerian problem is systemic and it requires broad spectrum solution to it. We cannot just close our eyes and our ears and expect that these guys who are holding Nigeria hostage will just quit. Why would somebody give up his enterprise? A group of young people on 20th of October, 2020, stood there at Lekki and they were campaigning for the whole world to hear their voice. They are crying out. They are graduated, no job. Nobody's listening to them. They are asking for, 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 for time. They are asking for platform. Nobody listened to them. The next thing was they sent an army to come and butcher them, and yet they are denying it. We are not talking about docility. We are talking about a group of, a group of survival, a group of people who believe that now they have reached the top, everyone else will stay where they are. And if you want to come to the top, you have to swear allegiance to the people at the top. You have to even swear an oath. They have to take you to God, gods, gods of other nations, to swear an oath in order to remain allegiance to them. Imagine okay. somebody paying money okay. to an ex-governor to remain a governor. Imagine yes. somebody paying money we, to a group of people to remain Dr. in Ode, leadership. Yeah, Dr. Um, Ode, we know we are confronting a, a kind of monster at the top. Perhaps Dr. Adelaja, are you there? Perhaps I want you to interject here, Dr. Adelaja, because I know that you are part of uh, um, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. How did Ukraine give us a, an insight of how Ukrainians came about the Orange Revolution? You are muted, sir. Yes, sir. The, you are still on mute. Uh, you know, the reason why I want Dr. Adelaja to give us an insight about the Orange Revolution of Ukraine, because that was a system that was perfected to change an inherent problem in Ukraine. Is it there? Okay. Um, can someone check? He says, is it from us or is it from a doctor? Doctor, it's, is I think it's from his mic. He's not on okay. his front. Uh, All right. So, but, but okay. you can you can go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Yes, oh, I can yes. hear you. Okay. Sorry, please. Apologies. Uh, yes, the same problem that Nigeria is facing now is what Ukraine was facing. The oligarchs, the few elites had taken over the country. They were running the country the way they wanted, and then they rigged the election. So people like myself and other uh, public opinion leaders, you know, the opinion leaders, they stood against it. Our church alone took 10,000 people out to the street for two months. And, you know, people like that. So... But of, of course, before that happens, we need to be able to educate the populace, educate our people, I mean, they, and let them know that they are the owner of the power. We, they are the owner of the country. It's not the government that is the owner. But the way, the way things are right now in Nigeria, as long as the electorate are waiting to get rice and bread from the campaigning politicians, that power, they are giving it away. They have been compromised. So when the populace is compromised like that in a large, a large segment of them, 
uh, then, you know, the politicians will keep on riding on them. So what we need to do is to have those people, like those lakey guys, the young, educated, progressive minds, to form a group. Like, for example, I personally, our church, we, I, we, we formed 3,000 groups registered. I mean, no, no, sorry. 600 of them were registered, but others were not registered. But we had 3,000 social pressure groups sent across the nation to sensitize the country and to mobilize the nation. So we must have people who are ready to put their life and their comfort on the line, just like the Lakey youth did. And organize. We have to pay the price of organization. Somebody has to be able to pay that price. Talking, 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 talking. That is the speciality of Nigerians. They can talk. But we need people who will be organized enough to put structures. What are the politicians? What is, what is their age? The politicians are winning in Nigeria, the corrupt politicians, because they have organized criminality. They are organized. But we need righteousness as well to be organized. We need to organize justice. We need to organize equity. If we just talk, 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 and we don't have people who are ready to pay the price of organization, pay the price of structure, systems, we will never get anywhere. We'll just be talking, and they will be riding on us. In that setup, Dr. Adelaide, you said, this is what I'm talking about. People don't seem to understand me. Perhaps maybe I will speak my local language so that people will understand me. <laughs> you see, the truth about the matter is economic factors will come later. We can perfect our economic system. But the political system must have to be in place to enable economic progress. That's what I keep saying. Our people must possess the power. In Nigeria, we have been talking about this politician having this cr criminal criminal gang and they have the way with all the phone they have the power to continue like that if we don't dismantle it we are not going anywhere that's my that's my position now some of you are based in nigeria professor onochuku you know that sars and sars came and we're very hopeful that this thing was going to change the system after the killing in lucky it disappeared. In 1988, we were part of the, uh, 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 what do you call it, the Babangda must go issue. 1986, we opened the prison in Ife. Just after two days, it disappeared. You just heard Dr. Adelaja. Ukraine was able to change their system because the people were determined. Where is this lacking in Nigeria? Well, um, I want to tell you, let me start from the issue you talk about the economy, you know, getting to take care of, you know, the politics before you talk about the economy. No, 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 no. You must talk about the economy first because that is, you know, the base of every. Somebody's must eat before he thinks politically. So the problem in Nigeria is that the level of poverty here is such that once you give somebody dangle a few naira in the front, the person is ready to take it and leave everything. So you don't separate economy from you know politics completely. These politicians are so wealthy that when the time for election comes, what they just need to do is to get to the electorate and give them something, and they will follow them. So what happened in Lake, you know, was a kind of thing that we thought was going to bring you know solution to this country. But just see how it died, because in their respective families, people will begin to tell them. What are you killing yourself? Have you eaten today? How much have you derived from that? So the basic thing is, how much are the people getting in order to sustain themselves? You know, that is the basic line. So until, if you're comparing Ukraine with Nigeria, it's far apart because in Ukraine, the system is moving. At least the people can, you know, they can eat, you know, and come out to talk to government. But in Nigeria, the situation is not the same. Here, the level of poverty is such that the people are blinded. What they are looking for is what to eat. And when once the politicians come out to, you know, give them some little carrot, some bags of rice, and all that, you know, they follow. And that is the system we're I, having here. I tell you, Doctor Professor what? Professor Nishuku, let me tell you something. Yes. For the fact that you say yes. hunger is the issue is begging the question. Hunger have always driven revolutions in French. Bread drove the revolution in France. French bread revolution. Um, Arab Spring, 
it was hunger that started it in Tunisia. Go check. <laughs> but if you begin to say it's because Nigerians are too poor, that's why the politicians are riding on us. It's like begging the question. I think I I, I think I, I got that right. Mm. No, let 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 me tell you. You you have you left Nigeria over how many decades ago? <laughs> you don't know really what obtained here. I'm sure that uh, my uh, brother who is who has organized, you know, as part of election, will tell you what happened here. If you come here on a real election day, particularly when we begin to enforce one man, one vote, you see politicians will line up and bring some funerals and bright people, 5,000, 2,000, 3,000, they will go and do their thing. And no, no, what I'm saying, me, in essence, see, is that, let, see, me come, let me, okay, let me well, come, let me come, okay. let me come. What I'm saying is that in what happened in Lake, we could build on that to ensure that things are done right. But you see, Nigerians are people that we can get now with fantastic ideas and carry out a particular thing successfully. And after that, everybody goes home. Who drives it is a problem. Because of the area where we come from, we have to need to tell you, mind your family, mind where you're coming from. You have not done anything in your life. You want to stick like you know all those kind of things are the things that actually worry Nigeria. And again, the fear of weapon. Each time this happens, those in power uses the weapon, use security operations to intimidate you know Nigeria. And you really need people who want to stake their life to continue to fight the security men. I mean, if you are out and you see people carrying guns shooting directly at you, definitely you are wrong. Like what happened yeah. in you shot people yeah. and kill them. And if that continues, somebody of the people will run away and they will come out. So these are the yeah. kind of things we are facing. Yeah. Unless Timmy. you have mass movement everywhere, that is the only way to know it. Exactly. Timmy, Timmy yeah. you are a participant in the political process in Nigeria. We are talking about mass yeah. movements. Now, how do yeah. you how do you enable mass movement? Because I that's if I feel I still believe that's the way out. How do you okay. enable it? Is it possible? <laughs> It's a really interesting question, but I, I, I think what the problem is with the masses, because I, I really understand the point that my brother is making, the professor, is that really, it's, it, and it even goes a bit further because it didn't start in one day. So the people have gotten to a point where they now are convinced that there is no point because they're not going to get anything out of it. So give me my own now and go and do what you want to do. That is the deal. It's that bad. So, but let us look at places where we're talking about how do you fund political processes? How do you, how, how, how do you take people and make them do something? And in the Orange Revolution, there's an example of 10,000 people that went from um, Dr. Adelaide's church. I'm not advocating people go out on the street because yes, it is true, you will get shot. So why do you want to do that? What I'm suggesting is let's try and use the political process. Why is the church important? It is one of the places where you see poor Nigerians. No poor Nigerian would donate money to a politician. Why? But they are donating poor their money, poor people, but they are donating money to church. How many wards are there in Nigeria? I don't even know. I mean, local governments are 790 something. I don't know how many wards there are. No, seven, seven. <laughs> but I don't know how many wards there are. But look at the look at the churches. The churches have how, how many parishes? The big ones, some 30,000, some 40,000. Look, okay. if, 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 there are things we can do, you know, and, and we just need to think about it differently and we can we go and get involved. Let me tell you, somebody, in fact, there was a, so it, 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 how do you get on the party ticket? You must get the vote from the ward level. I mean, without going into detail of how all those things work. Those parishes are there. There are parishes in those wards. And some of the people, go, they, are, they are part of the church. So why can't we think Thank of how we can? Yeah. That brings us to another big you, issue. You, you. That brings us to another yeah. big issue. Dr. Adelaide, if you are there, <laughs> okay, you just heard what Agama, the, Mr. Gama said about people not delinquent to the political process but want to bring money to the church. 
somebody somewhere in the one event I, I attended also said this because we don't we are afraid to say things like this if you say it they say you are not you are, you are an atheist because you don't believe in god dr delaje you are a pastor i have seen your forum criticizing your fellow pastors nigeria have a problem you go to church the next day say don't go to the street let's pray about it like i said before prayer without action is dead. faith without action is dead do you agree that um, if we commit a little bit of what we are doing to the political process or what are from the church we commit to the uh, political process life will be better yeah right it's now the way the way religion is run in nigeria church and mosque it now religion and church has become a liability on nigeria itself because most people in the country go from the from the from the horse's mouth sir yes sir what you said, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, we, they always say, oh, only God can save Nigeria. It's a myth. Not only, God doesn't have anything to come and save Nigeria from. You, is it God that built uh, Saudi Arabia? Is it God that built Dubai? Is it God that built uh, Singapore? Is it God that built, you know, all these countries that we are talking about, America, Canada that you are in? Now God come build them. <laughs> it is a liability. Church has become a problem. Now, I personally believe that the Nigerian church is now creating responsible for our economic recession. I, I'm, I know big, big GOs in Nigeria, and I will tell you that one church in Nigeria, one church, collects 20 billion naira every Sunday. And they are not putting it into economy a billion. They collect from poor people. And this man has several jets. And, you know, people, and people, they keep on collecting. If, I, I think if people have conscience, pastors have conscience, and you see that these people cannot even eat on one dollar a day, stop now. Why can't you stop collecting and say, okay, we have enough. Now, all of you who are poor, who cannot afford one, a meal, please come. Give me your economic project. What do you want to do? Empower them. Give them jobs. Can you imagine what will begin to happen if churches in Nigeria will begin to empower their members? Not just to give them food to eat, but to give them skills, to give them job, to give them... We, 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 the church itself is able to transform that whole country. But our church has become greedy. Our church has become uh, irrelevant. They are taking from the poor. I, I personally think that if oh yes, you take from the poor as long as if you need if you if the church is poor and you don't you need something. But if the church is already deadly rich, I have bankers in Nigeria who are managing some accounts of pastors and some accounts of churches. They are saying that. If you see how much money are just lying down there, you will cry for all those members who are going across the street, back, you know, doing evangelism and for all these people. And they can they look wretched. You know, so you, for, for me, like the, the church is a problem. We need to educate the Thank church. You. We need to wake the church up so that the church will take upon the responsibility of national building, nation building responsibility I upon like the church. I feel like hugging you, Dr. Adelaide. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, let me let me stop at that, and I will give room to um, the open question and answer from the floor. Um, it's better for us to hear from the audience, not just uh, five of us. Um, are we ready with the question and answers, please? We have we have a lot of of questions and answers. Randomly, randomly go with some questions. I'll. I'm, conscious of time because i know that nigeria this is 8 p.m ukraine i i don't 10, 10 p.m two hours ahead 10 p.m two hours ahead of nigeria so let's uh, let's get this done questions please. we have a question from ezea di onukulu and the question is how do you propose we address the issue of their use of the people's funds for their own political objectives. I think um, he's referring to the politicians here. How do we address this issue? Dr. Day, can you take that? Uh, can you repeat the question a little bit? So Isaiah is asking, how do we address the issue of politicians using people's funds 
to run um, for their own political objectives? Because there is absolutely no system in place to check and monitor political process and campaign funding. You see, someone had mentioned here that Nigeria is kind of uh, a reflection of a failed state. Uh, and I will add to that by letting you know that there are a whole lot of stuff wrong with Nigeria. The system is not functioning properly. The only option we have right now, and I'll repeat it again, is first and foremost that Nigeria must go back to the drawing table. Our founding fathers who helped us with independence, we are in a rush to be independent, that they ignored some red light or red flag. And we got independence and everything was a little bit smooth and running. But eventually the, the evil that we ignored caught up with us. Corruption, lack of understanding, lack of power blocks and power sheep, ships in the international community. Nigeria is an asset-based economy, asset-based entity or asset-based uh, let me use the word contraption. People are interested in the country, like they're interested in other African countries, for the purposes of nothing but for the economic interest of the imperialist. Thank Our you. forefathers ignore that. Thank so you. The, the, the problem we have in Nigeria is that the, the politicians who took over continue the same process, the same process of taking advantage of the wealth of the country for their own personal gain. Can this be stopped? I think it's going to take a miracle. Because right now, the entire power structure is being controlled by this elitist. And Thank the you. proletariat, the common man, will have to do something. And Thank I can you. tell you what they have to do later. Thank you. Thank you. More questions, please, from the floor. Yes, I have AK Oduoza. AK Oduoza is asking, I think, if I can summarize his question, he is wondering why no one is saying we should um, break up or we should really restructure the, the, the country? Well, uh, let me quickly uh, moderate that. It is not, the panelists have not, none of the panelists have agreed that we should break up. But on the other platform, perhaps we can address that. But we are, the panelists have all agreed that we need to restructure. Restructure does not, it's not the same thing as breaking up. More questions, please. Then we have from Dr. Rika Kelly, the role, if the media has a role in telling our, our story. I know someone mentioned about, I think it's the Dr. Day that was saying we need to tell our stories better. Um, so what is, how can we hold the media responsible? Timmy Agama, you are, you, you are politically involved in Nigeria. What is the role of the media in, in addressing the, the issues in Nigeria? And the role of the media is, is one of compromise. They are part of the poverty system. And therefore, they are, they, it's true now, they are part of the poverty system. And so what they are, they, they, they are the unfortunate position they find themselves in. It's not a, let me be clear. I mean, I don't want to sound as if there aren't any uh, well-meaning journalists. And I don't really want to sound as if there aren't any people who are struggling to tell the right stories or, you know, to say this is happening or that's happening. But I'm dealing with the, the reality on ground for the majority of people. I mean, you have people who their, their, their publishers don't even pay salary. You know it. Then how do they eat feed and how do they eat? It's when somebody gives them brown envelopes. So what are they going to write? You know, the system becomes, you know, it's, it's, that's the system. And, and, but all of that, the key thing to remember is that everything that is happening derives from political power. And so my, 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 my view is seek power first, right? Seek power first. And when you have power, you can, you can make your change. And so my message is, what is the process based on what I have seen? How do you do it? You know, how do you think about it? Seek power, organize, look at how you're going to raise funds, look at how you choose, the people who you say you want to, 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 to fund. And then also look at the quote unquote consultants that you are going to hire, who are experts that are going to help you in the process. And from there, you start to get political power. And when you have political power, then you make the change. I mean, in all your state, Shay McIndy is making his own change, but he had his own funds 
And I will tell you, he spent a long time learning. It's not like he just had his own funds and he did it, which is why I talk about knowledge, about what do you do and how do you do it. It took him time to learn, and I can understand why, because when you come from outside, you don't really understand, and you think, oh, you know, you know, da, 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 da. But the way it really works is slightly different. So it's important to follow how does it work, take control of it with your own funds and your own people and your whatever, then you hire your own quote-unquote consultant, and then you do what you want to do. So at that point, you will be using the media the same way that other people are using the media, because you have your own funds. So you'll be funding your own story. That's how I see it. Okay, and as a follow-up to that, we have a question from Daniel Okunima. Um, I know you mentioned that we should use our own funds at the grassroots level to, to, um, to put our people in power, but he's saying that, how do we tackle the problem of paying for votes as we try to ensure the right people get into power? Can I, if, if, if I, if, if I can, if, I'm not suggesting oh, that grassroots people pay. In church, you know, they trust that system. They can pay, and the church can decide if there's a good candidate the church wants to support. That's a different process. But if we, the type of people who are sitting down here now having this conversation, if we have decided, then on the Nigerian side, look, let's be realistic. How much does it cost to educate a child abroad? How much does it cost to educate your child abroad, my brother? And after you spend that money on that education, it's very good job is the child coming to do in Nigeria. The child wants to leave Nigeria. I don't even understand. So at some point, we need to, why don't we invest something in trying to solve the problem that we're about to die? The, the, the distance from our door is just, every day it comes closer. So... Why don't we, who are the ones who have a little bit more, start the, we have to start the process. We can't wake up and say, oh, we want poor people to start it. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Why are we the ones that are educated? Why are we the ones that are more privileged? We have to take the lead. It is when they trust what we are doing that they will say, okay, yes, they can join. But the, the, the church is in a different position because they already trust the church. So the church is, is ahead. And the church can now make its own decisions about, oh, maybe I can fund this person or fund that person and take this type of thinking and we can do this, do that. We have these people at these grassroots. What can we do? You know, we have these people in all these parishes. So the church has, you know, the big churches have, they're really in a different position. They're really in a different position. You know, maybe they are free. I don't. Okay, I think we lost him. There. I don't know. So I, I, but I, 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 that, 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 let me, let me interject here. There's a, <laughs> there's a monster currently in Nigeria confronting each and every one of us. Uh, Timi Agama, uh, if uh, you're Nigeria, I don't know if you the last time you traveled by road to your, to your village. I can't the even thing, move. The same thing the, with Professor. I can't even move to the outskirts to the outskirts of Guagualada, talk about my village. <laughs> the I, same I thing. Of, of Abuja, I cannot move. Talk yeah. about my village. I can't go anywhere. The same thing with Professor Onochuku. Now, how do we confront this issue of herdsmen taking over Nigeria? Um, I was raised by my father to say, if somebody comes to you, brings fight to your house, everything you have, you used to defend yourself. Am I correct? Yes. But why is it that Saturnas cry more? Yeah. The herdsmen have taken over our villages. Even when my father used to farm, I would go after school to go to farm. I asked my brother, you dare not go there anymore. They're afraid of herdsmen who come either from Niger, Niger or Mali. So how do we confront it? Again, perhaps... What? Is the issue that I keep talking about. Professor Onjuku, how do you, what do you have to say on that? Well, um, I will talk from the experience we have from my own state here. I'm from River State. And uh, the government of River State is not taking it easy. You know, um, it's not also allowing the kind of thing that is happening, you know, up there to happen here. 
Number one, there is a, a law now that uh, the government has passed on open grazing. If you're caught, you go in for it. And then our people also are also prepared themselves, you know, against this. You can't just come and destroy our farmland and you go. No, it doesn't happen. Like in my place here, they don't try it at all. Because if they try it, they will also see that people will, uh, you know, Prof, come out. Where, and, uh, when you say your like place, where is that? I am from River State. Where in the River Equiry State? Equiry, I want to be precise. That is my place. So if you come to our place here, they don't come here to disturb us because they know the way we will react. If you're living in a place, you should live peacefully and organize your business in such a way that you don't disturb other people's business. I mean, you can't just carry your cow and run to the farm and destroy you know, the farmland. And you think that your cow will be alive for you to sell and make money. Meanwhile, the farmer has lost all the It can't happen. So until we begin to resist some of these things, because the government is not, uh, the government at the center is no longer, you know, protecting the people. It's an obvious thing that the body language of government in the center is supporting, you know, what Meiji you know, is saying and what these cattle are doing. So the best thing is to ensure that in your place it doesn't happen. And if you have people in your place that say that it won't happen, it won't happen. And also somebody told me the experience in their place. They'll have your area. In short, there they will ban eating of cow. So you don't even bring it. You know, so we must do something as a people. If government has decided not to protect us, to protect our people before they will finish, you know, our farmland and also enter to drive us, you know, from the community. Got it. <laughs> okay, we have two more questions from the audience, and okay. um, I'll let yes. you wrap this up. So yes. first is from Value Initiative. He's saying what do we do with international interest to always manipulate the political cloud of the nation? In just not in Nigeria, but across Africa. I will ask Dr. Uh, Professor Onujuku to take yes. that because I've read you yes, in different forum where you have advocated uh, for yes. value, val value added um, yes. system. So I want you yeah. to take that. Well, in a situation where the leadership is corrupt. What the people do is to come here, see how they can manipulate your leadership to get what they want. It's just like what Dr. Godwin was saying, that you have the people that don't have capacity to lead, but because they are in power in order to make money, in order to make business. So when you know the international you know moguls come in, they just you know manipulate them and uh, they will listen. Look at what is happening in, Ara, in Nigeria. We keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. In short, now, the borrowing is about 32 trillion in Nigeria. And we'll continue to borrow, like Mr. President has said in his budget presentation. The deficit is the 2022 that is coming is over 6 trillion. And we're going to borrow that. So they come and manipulate us and tell us that, look, you can benefit from borrowing. We will borrow your money. I will continue to borrow and indebt the country you know, further. Then in terms of value addition, let me say something in terms of value addition, because it's the key to the Nigerian economy. That's why I say I'm going to talk about the economy as we're going. You see, if an economy does not add value, definitely you will remain under the vicious cycle of underdevelopment. What we did in Nigeria is to dig up crude oil, which is primary product, and sell in international market get revenue and share it between federal, state, and local government to finance development in quotes. And when the money gets to the officers, they embezzle it and they eat it to add value to our primary product. That is the only way you can earn high foreign energy and make the economy better. If we continue with this issue of just selling crude oil and bring the money and share between state and local government, nothing will happen. In the petroleum industry, we don't even add value at all. At all. That's why those in the creek are beginning to add value in the crude way. But we are destroying them because they are illegal. Why can't we look at what they are doing and see how we can add value to it so that we can refine at the very you know, low level, what we call modular refinery, so that we can sell and make foreign exchange to develop other sectors. You know? so, but because you have few Nigerians that have decided to hold Nigeria to you know, serious ransom, by taking our crude outside, refine and come and sell to us. 
So that's the kind of economic you are. We are not adding value. We are Thank not producing. You. So right. the economy is docile. You know. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anushu. Final so last, question. Yes, final, final question. Uh, and maybe it's for Dr. Ude. It's um for us in diaspora, it's by Solomon Iwegim. It's for us in diaspora. What practical steps can we take to effect the change we seek for our dear country, Nigeria? Okay. Um, thank you very much for that question. I think I discussed briefly with the president about this, and I did point out uh, that we can take a cue from other nations. Take, for example, uh, Japan. After the Second World War, most of them, uh, especially the intellectuals, and the innovators, they moved on and moved over to the United States. They became very powerful. They went back and started creating value in their country. China today did not become what it is in isolation. Most of them sent their kids. They came over to the United States. They read, they studied. They were able to capture American system. And they joined the World Trade uh, uh, you know, uh, Organization. Eventually today, China in about 35 years is more developed than countries that you know, we're even ahead of them. So Nigerian diaspora, they have a lot of role to play. And it begins by first and foremost, articulating our vision for Nigeria and understanding where things have gone wrong and presenting a common front. We must go back to the drawing table by ensuring that there will be no election until we found out what we are actually electing people to do. That can be done. The diaspora Nigerians have tremendous wealth and power to influence Nigerian narrative, both locally and internationally. Thank you. The second, oh, the second yeah. approach, the second approach is for us to understand that the media has a tremendous role to play. And so we must be able to find out what are those narratives that have been pushed out by the Nigerian media, both locally and internationally. Who are they representing? Are they representing the people? Are they representing the government in power? Media has a lot of power to change, but not but political setup and economic setup. Now the third point is that we must build allies. The diaspora must build allies, global allies, international allies. That's what causes power shift. Right now the world is moving in blocks. Which block does Nigeria belong to? Unless we find where we belong, we'll not be able to survive in the next 10, 20 years. And number four, we must increase capacity. The diaspora Nigerians can trickle in with their innovation, with their wealth, with their knowledge, with their capacity, and begin to change from the grassroots. I thank you for what you're doing at uh, Timi Agama. That's exactly what we are thinking about. And also, Professor K. you are close home, and you are going to be a reference point for what is about to happen. Can Nigeria change? Yes. But we have to do things the right way. We have to take the knowledge we've acquired outside of the shores of Nigeria back home. And we have to do that from the grassroots. We have Thank to engage you. the mass media. We have to also align with people who believe in transforming the country. And we can borrow a leaf from other countries that have also transformed, uh, other people that transformed their countries from diaspora. And we have examples of that. Thank, Thank you. you. Finally, final question for Dr. Adelaja. Uh, two questions, sir, mm -hmm. if you are listening, because I know you are you're going to run out soon to go prepare for tomorrow's church. <laughs> um, Dr. Delaja, yes, two sir. questions. You told us one, I want you to weigh in on this issue about what people in diaspora uh, can uh, do um, about Nigerian situation. That's one. Two, you told us that you'll be going back to Nigeria soon. And you have also... Uh, you are not a very good fan of how churches are run in Nigeria at present. If you go back to Nigeria, how will you act differently? Two questions. Okay, number one, uh, what the diasporas can do. Being a pastor, <laughs> I know what tithe and offering means. All pastors preach about tithe and offering, that people should give that offering. The first thing I want to tell the diasporas is use your tithe and offering to develop your villages, where you come from, communities where you come from. It is a better and a greater service to God Almighty than giving into some 
deadly, deadly rich pastors already. Or use that money, find out the widows, the uh, orphans, and the uh, destitute that are, you know, just look, they are everywhere in Nigeria. Send, be sending your tithe and offering to them and they get people to help you organize that in Nigeria. You will get more reward for that in heaven than taking your tithe and offering to church. That is number one. Number two, let us begin to ad adopt straight villages, you know, fix the road, you know, uh, bring medical services, just do things we could do from the diaspora, you know, to what we see, what we have seen abroad here, that it is more godly to do good works, to impact the society than just to be going to church to pray. That is number one. Secondly, what will I do differently, personally? When I go to Nigeria, I'm not getting ready to go and start another church. Because Nigeria has too many churches. So that's what is out of the issue. Unless God made me to the world. I don't think. What I want to go to Nigeria to do is to show the example of how to transform society to the principles of the Bible. Use love to transform your neighborhood. Use justice to bring equity. Use, you know, you know uh, love your neighbor as yourself to be able to bring peace between Christians and Muslims, between Northerners and Southerners, between politicians and the people who follow them. You know, just go and bring about principles of national transformation. That's what I want to do. But more than anything else, I would like to contribute to uh, elevate poverty of as many people as God will help me to do. Amen to that. I think... Look, can, I add one? can I add something to it? Yes. Yeah. Um, what he has said is super. Let me give you an example. There is somebody from my place that came and built a factory. That factory produces tissue paper and serviettes. And because of that, this factory, most of the youths that are, we have been involved in some insecurity problem are employed there. So if you come to my place, there is calm because of what that man has done. He didn't also stop there. He also developed very big farm and hash rate. And so many of the people that are growing up, that are some of these boys that are causing problems with society, are employed there. So there, they are calm because they have jobs. So those of them in the hash rate can bring in their income and develop, you know, many factories in their community. That will employ people. If we solve the problem of unemployment, it means that we have solved the problem of poverty halfway and we have solved the problem of Nigeria halfway. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Mr. Moderator, since you are allowing other people to chip in on this on this particular subject, may yes. I also chip in on this particular go ahead, subject? Sir, go ahead, sir. Yeah? Please, please, you know, I I I what I would please advocate is that all of these things are good, but let us not underestimate what political power can do. Political power can do all of these things. And if we focus on that, we can take over. It's a question of understanding. I'm just talking of what these people are doing. We can use the same systems. We can use the same systems. So there's huge wealth abroad. If we work separately, we will do good things. But if we work together, we can take over political power. And when we take over political power, then everything changes. The game has changed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Timmy. You see, as the moderator, <laughs> there are many questions about political economics and uh, other things I wanted to, I was directed to ask. You know, I started at the beginning by saying that uh, start let's start from the basis political power and every other thing will be added onto, onto it and uh, thank you for just uh, for reinforcing that um i want to thank uh, first of all um the ambassador his his excellency the high commissioner of uh, of nigeria to canada mr uh, ashekun um i want to also thank the panelists and uh, the keynote speaker, Dr. Sunday Adelaja. And I hope to see you soon. I mark that. Uh, Dr. Gordon, who is based in Surrey and British Columbia with me, I want to thank you for the incisive comments. And Professor Oke Onochuku, who sooner than later may I be the Vice Chancellor of the University of Port Harcourt, 
you are very visible there. I read your profile, very encouraging. I want to thank you for showing up. And my very good friend, but not the least, Timmy Agama. And you're based in Abuja. Thank you for an incisive comment and uh, we are part of the political process. I cannot have a better panelist. I want to thank you all. I want to thank Nigeria Association for organizing this. This has been one of the best and best independence gift, uh, independence anniversary gift since I arrived there over two decades ago. And I want to thank you. Let this continue. We should not be partying all the time. Let's do some brain exercise. And this is what I, this is what I love. Um, <laughs> with that, I will invite the technical crew led by Samzi to play the a, a video that will be very energizing to the Nigerians attending this function. Samzi, take that away. Protein. This is a public service announcement. Please take two minutes and listen to a very simple idea. It's an initiative of the It Starts With Me movement, and we'd like to invite you to be a part of it. The idea is simple. Now more than ever, there seems to be so much bad news about the state of our country, from education and healthcare to corruption and bad governance to poverty and unemployment. We spend all day, every day, talking, tweeting, and complaining about our problems. But what if, individually and collectively, we all bought into the idea that we can each be a part of the solution? What if we all decided that once a week, we'd each go beyond just talking to actually intentionally doing something about our problems? What if, once a week, we each played a part in rebuilding Nigeria into being the kind of country we all want to see? We're calling it Community Service Saturday NG, and every Saturday you can join millions of Nigerians from all over the world to do something, no matter how big or small, in service to our country. And you can participate right there in your local neighborhood by doing any kind of community service that you want and using the hashtag community service saturday ng when posting about it you can volunteer at or donate to an orphanage food bank or charity initiative you can gather your friends or family together and do something as simple as cleaning a street in your neighborhood you can even help an ngo that needs awareness or fundraising by just reposting their activities on your social media you can help out at your church mosque or school no matter how big or small your community service effort is, everything counts. As long as you go beyond talking to actually doing something, anything, every Saturday, to make Nigeria a better place. We are the change that we seek. We are the solutions that we need. The country we want to see, it starts with you, it starts with me. Thank you. That is very incisive. That is what we call call to action. If you're in Nigeria, do your part, not only criticizing the leaders, because we're also let the followers speak for us. Play your part. And that's what we demand. Thank you. And um, thank you very much. I want to call on the president of Nigerian Canadian Association of British Columbia, Soye Brown. Soye Brown, take it away. Uh, well, um, once again, I, on behalf of the association, want to thank all of us. Um, the chairman of the organizing committee, the honorable vice president of the association will offer the vote of thanks. And he's in the person of our friend, uh, Sam Osahele. Uh, take it away, Sam. I wonder if just before Sam gets um, his, his, his video on, if we can play the message from the police here in Vancouver. Oh, that would be excellent. Thank you, Mr. Sigurd. Congratulations and happy to celebrate Nigeria's Independence Day. It's your 61st anniversary. Thank you to Sawyer Brown, who's chair of the Nigerian Association of BC, we value our strong relationship with this community. Yeah, that shows that we are we are good good uh, citizens of uh, 
British Columbia. The police have testified to that. Thank you, Soye Brown, for leading us aright. <laughs> as a matter of fact, um, the Vancouver Police Division nominated us as one of the uh, members of the soon to be established uh, Black Advisory Committee in the Vancouver area. And uh, they consider us uh, as one of their partners in progress in law enforcement. And uh, we are honored to be in the good graces of law enforcement in the province. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Sam. Sam, are you there? I think he's having some issues with his, his video. Okay, can so you, yeah, you can, can you can yes. do that. And so um okay, he's here now. Oh thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, everybody in uh, British Columbia and then good evening, those in Nigeria. I want to say a big thank you to the panelists, Professor Oke Onachuku, Simi Agama, Dr. Godwin Ude, and Dr. Sunday Adelaja for honoring us with uh, your esteemed presence and uh, participating in this uh, Nigerian 64th, uh, 64th uh, Independence Lecture. I also want to say a big thank you to everybody that joined us from all over the world. We appreciate your presence and uh, the uh, discussions and uh, the solutions prefer uh, very timely. We just hope that uh, those that are at the ends of affairs will listen and uh, help us create a Nigeria that will be inclusive, that will be safe for everybody because the way things sound now, drastic change needs to be done. And uh, this uh, discussion forms part of those uh, conversations. Once again, I want to say thank you to everybody and uh, may God bless our great country, Nigeria. May God bless Canada, where we call home right now. And may God bless each and every one of us. Thank you, and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much, uh, Sam. Um, I will call on uh, uh, Doc uh, Alaji Brown to offer us a short prayer for the successful uh, posting of this uh, event. Isa Brown, Isa Lawa, sorry, Isa Lawa, Alaji Isa Lawa, are you there? I think we're having problems with his his connection. You may have to call on someone from the audience or the panel. Any anybody any Muslim here? If there's no Muslim, I will call on uh, the other statesman here, Mr. Imanul Onukulu. Please pray for us. <laughs> 